The Partnership for Water Sustainability had the fortuitous circumstance of having Storm Cunningham contact us literally out of the, the blue water. It was as a result of some of the work we've done in the past. I think it was the session we did in Nanaimo last year. Those of you who attended uh, Storm's lecture the other night, this might be a little bit of a refresher. But it's funny how people, champions, we get together, we align ourselves with others who we think think like ourselves. And I think that's how this happened. Storm reached out to the partnership and we said, we think we've got an invitation for you. And it was Storm who accepted the invitation to come here today, be a part of this symposium, and help us with what I think is one of the most innovating and exciting ways forward for all of us in the room, no matter where we are, whether we're a community group, a stakeholder, a local government staff person, the things that Storm's going to talk about is a way forward for us. So sitting down the other night with Storm, I said, Storm, describe yourself, thinking I was maybe going to get a traditional response about where I went to school and some of the values I had. And Storm looked at me and he says, well, I'm, I'm a hippie, green beret, scuba herpologist. <laughs> Did I say that right? Her herpetologist? The study of amphibians and reptiles. So, it t this describes a little bit about where Storm comes from. Passion, an incredible wealth of diverse experience. And you'll hear all of that come out in the uh, closing remarks that Storm's going to make for us. Storm's an author of two published books. The Restoration Economy, Read Wealth, and I understand he's got his third book that's going to be out shortly. He may actually talk a little bit about that. He's the publisher of a journal called Revitalization. One of the leading experts in the entire world on this trillion dollar industry that's emerging around renewal, restoration, redevelopment opportunities for anything. One of the things that, as I wind up into my career and I'm moving along and I'm thinking about retirement is, is what kind of a legacy am I going to lead? Am I going to lead and look back at this creek project that I was able to get done, a bit of policy that I was able to, to write? When I look at a legacy, one of the legacies that Storm is going to leave, this is where you really make a difference because it's been through Storm's direct involvement that numerous universities and colleges have raised millions of dollars in endowments to actually start new chairs around the things that he's talking about. So when you talk about the ability to institute an entire collective worldwide around a new way of thinking, that's, that's legacy. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to invite Storm up to close this off today. Storm. Okay, here's here's one of those uh, refresher slides. So you, you've heard uh, several folks talk about this uh, switch, or not so much a switch, but an addition to the whole ecological footprint concept or carbon footprint, where we measure the extraction that goes on as a result of our existence, uh, the damage that's done as a result of our existence and how that's a wonderful tool, but we also need to be measuring the good stuff we're doing, a restorative footprint, so we're actually moving forward on two feet, not just hopping along on one negative foot. So here's one of those refresher slides. We've reached a point now where we can no longer res uh, depend on just focusing on the old new development, you know, the sprawl, resource extraction, 
uh, mode of, of growing an economy. Um, if we want to continue growing on a finite planet with a fast growing population, the only way we can have a continuously growing economy is to base that economic growth on revitalizing the places we've already developed and on replenishing the resources that we've depleted along the way. If we do that, yeah, we can grow economically all we want. <clears throat> Here's what uh, that looks like in a different graph. We spent 12,000 years during the Holocene, you know, the period during which humans have been affecting the planet. To get to this point, it's called the uh, Anthropocene, which is the point at which humans dominate virtually all processes on the planet. Excuse me, processes. I got them north of the border. Um, <laughs> And we've been doing this, what I call adaptive conquest, adapting the world to our needs, uh, adapting it solely to our needs. And now we've reached the point uh, where we have to adapt to our adaptations, like climate change, you know, all these unintended consequences that have come out of uh, extracting and fragmenting and sprawling our, uh, our civilization. And the good news is that there's an alternative to this, because according to this chart, if we stay in that mode, both our economy and our resource base go into long-term decline. The alternative is to go into adaptive renewal mode, which is based on the opposite of extracting, sprawling, and fragmenting. It's based on repurposing what we've already created, renewing it. Repurposing comes first because in most cases you need to find a viable new purpose for a property or a structure. So you can raise the funds needed to renew it, and then to get the maximum value out of it, you've got to unfragment it, you've got to reconnect it. And if we do that, we can grow that economy, we can switch from this deconomy to a reconomy. And there's only two more, I think, refresher slides here, and then we'll get into the fresh stuff. So this is how most regions and communities redevelop or develop economically. Everybody operating their own little silos, pulling in different directions, no momentum, no direction, uh, and usually a lot of revitalizing activities without actual revitalization. So one of the takeaways from the 9 2018, I heard, I wasn't there, um, was an informed and educated stewardship sector as a catalyst for action. So uh, one of the things I've picked up on here is you guys have got a really informed stewardship uh, sector here um, to a much greater degree than I think I've ever seen down in the States. I've seen some somewhat similar levels uh, in, in Europe and uh, Latin America, but uh, uh, this is this is unusual. You know, most conferences like this that I go to in the states, it's all a combination of professionals and government people. Uh, the stewardship sector, the volunteers, nonprofits are uh, usually a pretty small uh, portion. So you guys have got that uh, pretty well together. So here's how most you've probably seen this cartoon before, but this is how most places go about creating revitalization. <laughs> yeah. They do a whole bunch of stuff, and sometimes it's very good stuff, and then hope that somehow revitalization will magically emerge from all that activity. You know, as, as if uh, hope is some kind of basis for the future. You know, there's no disciplined approach to actually creating revitalization, or resilience, for that matter, if that's your goal, or putting together a resilient prosperity. So, one of the things I heard here uh, from Tim Ennis uh, it was his, uh, his whole theme of reconciliation through restoration. You know, and he's got this, you know, after already doing three sawmill redevelopments and restorations, um, he's now starting on this magnificent 10 acre sawmill site and doing it in partnership with both the community and the First Nations. So, you know, that's, that's really the epitome of what you heard me talking about. Uh, the other night. And uh, Brian Cobol um, asked us, or asked the group that was up here, what are your strategies for engaging those who are not supportive of restoration? 
And Julie's, in Julie's presentation, uh, she said that the RDM and action plan facilitates collaborative relationships. So you've got a lot of themes here around engagement, collaboration, and cooperation. But the fact is, Brian's question uh, does touch upon a very real dynamic. You know, the fact is, there's a certain divide. You probably don't have it so much up here in Canada. Down south of the border, you've actually got people who think it's not in their best interest to conserve things and protect the environment and they think it's all about economic growth and the free market. I know, you, I know you guys can't understand that, but uh, it's true, Americans are like that. Um, you've also got a group that thinks it's business's job to make money and it's the public's job to clean up the mess they leave in their wake. There's an awful lot of that going on down there. <clears throat> and one of the other things I heard here is uh, from uh, Paul Chapman, who said it's easier to conserve what we have than to rebuild what we've lost. In fact, this we've lost a lot, so we need to rebuild a lot. But what's getting in the way are those sorts of uh, dysfunctional relationships. <laughs> so sometimes, uh, getting back to uh, Brian's theme, <laughs> the reconciliation ha needs to happen on several different levels. Uh, also between the business groups, the conservation groups, liberals, conservatives, uh, all these, all this reconciliation that needs to happen. And the fact is, just as Brian's title indicated, restoration is often the way it happens. Because strangely enough, the very same people who jump up and down and scream at you if you talk about fencing off a natural area to protect it from human activity, get really excited when you talk about taking a dead, nasty looking property that's been really damaged and bringing it back to life. The fact is, most people enjoy bringing places back to life. They enjoy making places more beautiful. They might not like the idea of setting things aside just for nature, but everybody can come together uh, around the theme of making places better. So restoration, revitalization, uh, even resilience tends to bring people together. Uh, but you know, it's not always hugs and kisses, uh, even when you're talking about something that's a fairly nonpartisan issue. Uh, one of the problems is that a lot of the stakeholder engagement processes aren't really all that good. You know, they're called stakeholder engagement, but uh, oftentimes it's just, uh, hey folks, glad you all came out tonight. Here's what we've decided to do. They've been engaged now. But the fact is, even if you do really good stakeholder engagement, you put together, try to put together really good partnerships, there are some people that really just don't want to get along. <laughs> that's a real that's a real sign, a real part. Hey, just we've just got to acknowledge the fact that these people exist. You know, don't be surprised when they show up and don't let them sabotage everything. Just acknowledge it's a certain species that uh, exists within your social ecosystem. And uh, I, I, I tend to call people like that slinkies. Uh, anybody here too young to remember what a slinky is? Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I call those people slinkies because you know, they're not good for much. Uh, but damn, they sure put a smile on your face when you push them down the stairs. <laughs> I've heard several people uh, in side conversations refer to the fact that they've got some stakeholder engagement issues in this area. Hey, I did some work in Jerusalem. Uh, you know, half the city is uh, Arab and the other half is uh, Jewish. You think you've got stakeholder engagement issues? Forget about it. You're living in paradise here. There are a lot of things that get in the way of our attempts to restore, revitalize, make places more resilient. Um, let me give you a few uh, indications of the sorts of diseases I encounter in my uh, work in these areas all around the world. One of the syndromes is uh, economic collapse disorder. 
It's uh, similar to the colony collapse disorder. And uh, unlike colony collapse disorder, we actually know what the problem is. Uh, in time after time, where I've seen a community's economy collapse or a region's economy collapse, even though there might be a lot of details that are different, one thing is the same, that people have lost confidence in the future of the place. It might just be the local people who have lost confidence. It's all the residents and employers and young people. Um, investors just go elsewhere. Uh, sometimes it's everybody, uh, even outside. The whole image of the community is one that's on its way downhill. And who wants to buy into something that's only going to get worse? And actually, the flip side of that is that the, the strange thing is, some places look really awful. You know, derelict buildings, brownfields, you know, depopulated, empty stores, all this sort of stuff. But they're doing something right that inspires confidence in their future. And an investor would much rather buy into a really nasty looking place that he or she is confident is coming back to life, that it's hit bottom. Then to buy into a community that looks really nice, but that's going nowhere, or worse yet, going downhill. You know, all an investor cares about is, is this going to be worth more tomorrow than it is today? That's all they care about. It's not the condition. That's why if somebody will go out and buy an old rusted out hulk of a car and restore it, because they know it's going to be worth more in the future. They don't, they don't care what it looks like now. <clears throat> This uh, uncertainty, you know, this loss of confidence, has an actual economic value. You probably can't see all the details on that chart, but it actually shows in the northeast corridor of the U.S. a direct correlation between the number of severe uh, storms and loss of property value. Now, I'm not just talking about the properties that were physically destroyed by the storm. I'm talking about overall property values. And when people lose confidence in a place, but they think uh, nothing but disaster is on the horizon, property values go down. <coughs> or as this fellow says, money is confidence. You know, the only reason a loony is worth a loony is because you think it will keep on being worth a loony. Uh, otherwise, it's just a, a piece of metal with almost no value. Uh, same thing with uh, any, any currency. It's all based, there's no gold standard anymore. It's all just based on people's confidence in the future. So there's a feedback loop involved here that can change a place's fortune really, really fast. That when you lose confidence in the future of a place, it increases the devitalization of the place. Like I said, people move out, investors don't come in, um, employers move out. And that devitalization reduces confidence in the future. So you get this negative feedback loop that just keeps speeding up and going right down the toilet. The good news is the opposite is true. The, when you have confidence in the local future, it increases revitalization. The more the place revitalizes, the more residents and investors and employers come in, the more confidence people have in the future. And you get this upward spiral that can you know, make, make a difference in an incredibly short period of time. OK, so back to the uh, dysfunctions and diseases, uh, social diseases that I find in these uh, places. Uh, another one is bipolar redevelopment, where Communities just get into this euphoria over this new project they've got going on that are is, they're convinced is going to save the community and put it on an uphill trajectory, an upward trajectory for a long time to come. And it doesn't happen that way. And they go into depression. And you, I talked to some people in some communities where they've been going through this for half a century. Up, down, up, down, up, down. And uh, sometimes they just keep on doing it. Other, other times they just finally decide Hey, nothing works here. Yeah, we're just going to stop trying. Another one of the problems is uh, schizophrenic redevelopment, where they say they want one thing while they keep on doing something that undermines that thing. You know, for instance, places that say they want to re revitalize their downtown, but they've still got sprawl-inducing policies on the books. You know, for instance, uh, uh, subsidizing sprawl. A lot of communities subsidize sprawl. They don't know they're doing it sometimes. But when a, when a developer suggests a sprawl community that's going to devitalize the downtown, and the community provides the public infrastructure, 
you know, the water uh, to service that place, free of charge, they're subsidizing the sprawl. Some places have finally worked waking up to that, like in Albuquerque recently. They just handed a developer a $600 million bill saying, if you insist on doing the sprawl out here, you're paying the full cost of the infrastructure. That's, uh, that tends to revitalize downtowns. So all of a sudden, that downtown looks really good as a place to invest. So the infrastructure is already there. Um, I think this might be the last of the uh, illnesses I run across. Uh, you've heard of repress, repetitive stress injuries. Um, there are also repetitive failure inju injuries, uh, similar to the bipolar thing I was talking about. But uh, this is where, like I said, they stop and they get into this negativity and pessimism. And the cause of this is that they keep doing the same dumb things over and over, instead of trying something new. You know, they, uh, <clears throat> they create visions. They have all kinds of great visioning exercises. But then they don't create a strategy to, to uh, bring that vision to fruition. Or they write a plan, but the plan has no strategy. And General Dwight D. Eisenhower once said, uh, planning's useful, plans are useless. <laughs> Another uh, reason they get into this repetitive failure um, syndrome is they do projects that don't have programs. So it's a stop, start, stop, start, inefficient, um, mode of development that gathers no momentum, inspires no confidence in the future. And sometimes, uh, usually, if they can get away with it, they'll do projects without partners. That sounds like some kind of social organization. <laughs> with parents without partners. Um, so you've heard a lot about partnering uh, from a lot of different people. I'm not going to repeat anything you've heard about Boken or Brooklyn. Uh, I'm assuming the levels of dementia in here are fairly low, that uh, you haven't forgotten that stuff yet, so uh, most of the references are going to be to stuff before those two presentations. Does anybody remember what I just said? <laughs> so, let me give you two examples of different kinds of partnerships. Most of the partnerships we've been hearing about so far have been what I might call kind of social partnerships, where different groups get together and they cooperate to achieve a goal together. But there are more formal kinds of partnerships. Um, many of them are specifically focused on solving the funding gap. And uh, down in the States, we, I know you've got them up here too, uh, we do tons and tons of public-private partnerships down there. Now, for a time there, especially in the 80s and 90s, uh, there were a lot of so-called public-private partnerships that were really privatization, and, uh, but they called themselves public-private partnerships. So some people have a really bad impression of what a public-private partnership is. It's not privatization. That's something totally different. Um, the simplest uh, definition I ever heard was from Jane Peach, who was the head of the Canadian Public-Private Partnerships uh, Group. Um, she simply said that a, a good public-private partnership is where a private partner takes a risk that the public partner can't or shouldn't take. That's it. If, you, if it's transferring the risk from the public to the private, then the private partner deserves to make some money. And uh, that's the essence of a good public-private partnership. Let me give, give you two quick, quick examples of good public-private partnerships that have absolutely nothing to do with water. You've, you've been hearing water partnerships out the yin yang for some time now. Just to illustrate the mechanics behind putting together a good public-private partnership for those few of you who might have funding gaps. Um, let me give you two examples. Both of these are from where I'm from, in Washington, D.C. One is the uh, Oyster Bilingual School. Uh, this was a much-loved institution, uh, but it was scheduled to be closed, even though it was the only multilingual school in Washington, D.C., uh, because it was just, it was out of money. At that time, the Washington, D.C. was broke, uh, not the first time it was broke. Um, and uh, the school had no maintenance budget, so it looked pretty decent on the outside, but inside it was a total mess. 
and you know, this desperately needed to be renovated. It was so unhealthy for the students that they said, yeah, we really need this multilingual school, but at the same time, we can't subject the kids to such an unhealthy environment. And it's in a really beautiful neighborhood. For those of you who know, know the area um, around the National Zoo, you know, it's a great neighborhood. And, uh, you know, these private developers have been cruising around this neighborhood for a long time trying to figure out where they could put some multifamily housing in because uh, they needed more affordable stuff. Uh, but, you know, plus it's, it's had all, the, all these amenities nearby, uh, plus the uh, connection to the metro. But they just couldn't find any land to put any multifamily uh, buildings on. Then this group came along, 21st Century School Fund. Their sole purpose, it's a nonprofit group, their sole purpose is to put together public private partnerships to solve educational problems. Because we have a lot of underfunded education down in, down in the States. So, what they did, um, actually, I think I missed uh, something there. Oh, okay, I have this. slides in the wrong order here. Okay, so Elcor is a, is a private uh, real estate developer. And they were one of those ones that was running around this neighborhood trying to figure out where they could put some multifamily stuff. 21st Century School Fund came along. They saw the problem of the school about to be closed, and uh, they were tapped in enough to realize that developers were looking for a place to put multifamily housing. So they brought the two together. And they found out that there was a chunk of property that the Oyster School owned that was just the right size to put an apartment building on. Uh, the school uh, gave the developer the land, and in return, they not only put the multifamily housing on it, but they donated all the money needed to completely renovate the school. Got a brand new gymnasium, $11 million gymnasium. The entire building uh, became state of the art. <clears throat> and that's what. Uh, that was the end result there. Beautifully uh, restored Oyster School at zero cost to tax dollars. I mean, have <laughs> zero, uh, zero cost to the taxpayers. You know, that's a good public-private partnership. Everybody came out ahead. Even the neighborhood came out ahead because they got more affordable housing. Uh, and I mentioned before that you know, for a private partner to take a risk, they deserve a reward. Uh, they put in $26 million and two years later got out $56 million. So that's why they'd be willing to partner with, with people. <clears throat> Here's another example. Anybody here ever been to Washington, D.C. and go through the Union Station? Anybody? Yep, okay, a few. So you probably know it as a beautiful place right now. But not that long ago, back in the early 80s, again, when Washington was going through a different uh, budgetary crisis. Um, they were just about to tear that down. One of the most beautiful buildings in Washington. Uh, but, you know, there was mushrooms growing on the floor. Uh, I mean, the whole place was decrepit, hadn't been used in decades. And uh, it, it was causing the entire neighborhood to go down. I mean, this is just a few blocks from the Capitol building. <laughs> you know, tourists going by here all the time. And this decrepit neighborhood and this flea bag of a building there, uh, just giving everybody a really bad impression of Washington, D.C. Uh, but city was broke, they couldn't afford to uh, uh, fund it. But then Jones Lyme LaSalle, a real estate developer, came along and said, well, if you don't give us the retail rights to the building, if you let us put in the restaurants and the, and the stores, we'll restore the whole building for you. They put in $160 million that's what it looks like today. As a matter of fact, it's going through another restoration now. And it even revitalized the entire neighborhood. So once that came back together, everybody started using it uh, again. And uh, there used to be nothing but vacant buildings around there. Now there isn't a single vacant building in the neighborhood. And the total cost of taxpayers, zero dollars. And uh, Jones Line LaSalle is uh, earning over 60 to uh, 70 million dollars uh, annually um, just from running the retail inside. I mean, that's a really good public private partnership. So I, I know that's got absolutely nothing to do with watersheds, but the dynamics there are what, what I want you to remember. So when, when, you're, when you're thinking, man, 
we really need to do this, but it's really a capital intensive, and there's just no way we're going to get it out of donations or even out of Ottawa. Um, yeah, don't don't just write off the private real estate developers. You know, think what is here that maybe after it's restored would somehow be uh, valuable to a real estate developer or some kind of company uh, where they could do something on the property that would be in keeping with uh, the watershed restoration goals. A little bit of imagination and some uh, good uh, research to find out what other organization, what problems uh, they have, you, you can come up with uh, solutions like that. So the other night you heard about the three re strategy, repurpose, renew, reconnect. But the problem is that even if you have a really good strategy and even a really good regenerative vision, strategic vision uh, that the strategy is implementing, it's really not enough. This is a blank slide. <laughs> this is not. I don't know what was on that blank slide. Um, so Kate Miller talked about restoring the uh, Cowichan River by reconnecting uh, one, of the, one of the many aspects of restoring the river, was uh, reconnecting what had been severed by a dike. So that's one of those uh, elements of the three re strategy. But, the, you know, like I said, the strategy itself isn't enough. So let me give you a little test. That's uh, iron ore, so I'm not going to ask you what that is. Um, so in one word, how does that become this? It's actually a bad example because Ford's making their pickups out of aluminum now. But, um, in just one word, let me give you a few more examples. One word. Okay, this technology, this one, one idea. Um, in just one word, how does dog food become dog spoop? <laughs> spoop, you've heard of spoop, right? Um, ah, ooh, I heard it. Um, in just one word, how do peanuts become peanut butter? In just one word, how does a desolate Main Street become a vibrant Main Street. In just one word, how does a landfill become a beautiful public park? This is actually uh, happening right now. There, New York City is turning uh, two old landfills into the uh, largest new uh, state park. In just one word, how does this old light industrial zone become a green spine for a city, which is happening right now down in Christchurch, New Zealand? In just one word, how does this totally empty old industrial zone that used to be one of the major employers in the city both extend and revitalize the city's downtown? That's in uh, Indianapolis. I think this is the last one. In just one word, how does this old industrial, I mean, this old rail yard become a beautiful city park, a water park, uh, you know, just the, the, the heart of the city. That, this happened already down in Gainesville, Florida. All right, so, what's that one word? Process. Okay, I'm hearing more of them now. Yep, process. Process. <laughs> Chris May, uh, through his surrogate, said uh, everything is important because everything is connected. And uh, process is the way to bring together that vision, the strategy, the partnerships, everything is needed to really make a spectacular difference in the area. You know, that's what most people think of as uh, when they think of the word process, something uh, quite mechanical. Um, but the essence of the process is to reliably produce something. And just about everybody who reliably produces, well, everybody who reliably produces anything has a process. Real estate developers have a process for revitalizing ground fields, which is an element of revitalization. Uh, restoration ecologists have a process for revitalizing ecosystems, another element of revitalization. 
So why don't the mayors and the governors and the presidents have a process for the actual revitalization itself? Why is the process only sitting there in the projects? But the people who are in charge of bringing a whole city or region back to life have no process for it. Coastal State Town is writing a plan. That's not even part of the process. Uh, planning is part of the process, uh, kind of. Um, but uh, and, you know, the other day we talked about how corporate leaders uh, value strategy. Well, corporate leaders also value process. Uh, Brandon Rex Tillerson is not one of my favorite people, but uh, you know he's right on when he talks about how the fact that the most important thing when you're changing anything, especially revitalizing it, is to focus on the process. So. Folks who are working on what should be the very most important agenda don't have a process. And uh, Nick Leon, um, one of the things he said during this conference was that we need to focus on restoring processes. And most people think in terms when they're talking about restoring ecosystems, they're thinking about the products of that ecosystem, the frogs, the fish, the oxygen, the clean water. Um, but underlying all of that are processes. We need, need to focus on restoring the processes. And he also said that we need to match the scale of restoration to the scale of the physical and biological processes that are driving it. Uh, Domenico said the watershed is the basic unit of, unit of ecology, um, and uh, the strategies are normally focused on the smaller, more manageable units rather than the watershed. Uh, Nick Lillen again said our restorative efforts are focused on single species and specific habitats, not watersheds. And uh, in case you're not tired of them yet, Nick Leon said we need integrated strategies to connect land and resources to restorative targets. So there's a lot of awareness of the importance of process in this room. One of the big you know, we've seen this huge uh, movement towards design-led innovation over the last few decades, you know, with uh, Steve Jobs being um, the superstar in that area. Uh, the problem is that almost all of it's been focused on stuff, designing nice stuff. And to change the world, we need to stop focusing so much on the nouns and focus more on the verbs. You know, what we're actually doing, because that's the essence of the process, is the action. And that's basically the difference between a vision and a strategy. You know, if, you, if you're confused about which one is which, just look at which one has the nouns and adjectives and which one has the verbs. You know, the vision should be loaded with nouns and adjectives. It's design, it's, it's your, it's your uh, picture of the qualities you want your place to have in the future. The strategy, and the sole purpose of the strategy is what? What? Yeah, we went over this class. <laughs> this is part of the first lecture. The sole purpose of the strategy is to achieve success. Thank you. I take back what I said earlier. <laughs> um, That's all the strategy is there for. Is success, is to achieve success. It's the thing that's most commonly missing from almost any effort because everybody uses the word and nobody knows what it is. I don't know, they usually think they know what it is. Uh, and, and they even usually think they have one. But then you go up to them and say, oh, what's your strategy? And if they're still talking a minute later, they don't have one. They punch you in the face. They don't have one, and they know it. A lot of people get really defensive about this. So I showed this to you uh, briefly um, before. This is kind of a universal process. And if you do this, you're almost guaranteed to succeed. You do it well. So you start off by creating a uh, program, an ongoing program, to create whatever it is you want, whether it's revitalization, restoration, resilience, it doesn't really matter. The key thing is it has to be an ongoing program. It's usually going to be housed in a nonprofit. First thing that program is going to do is create a regenerative vision. Next thing it's going to do is create a strategy to implement that vision. 
It doesn't have to be the three read strategy. That's, a, that's just a good starting point. Next, you need to create regenerative policies to support the strategy, or at least to get rid of any policies that will undermine the strategy. Then you start putting together regenerative partnerships, because now they're all being driven by the same vision, executing the same strategy, supported by the same policies, so they can put together regenerative projects. And you keep doing this, you reliably produce revitalization, just like a factory can reliably produce peanut butter, then uh, you're going to get that increased confidence in the local future. This is a minimum viable, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the uh, components here are all familiar to everybody. You've all heard, you all know what visions are, you probably think you know what a strategy is. Um, you all know what partners are, process, projects, policies. There's nothing on here that's unfamiliar. But you know what? In 20 years, I've never once run across a community or a region that had the whole process. They all have one or two or three or even four elements of it. But a process with missing components is not a process. It's like uh, manufacturing a car and not having a, a station there where they attach the wheels. So this is actually a minimum viable process. You can add to it can't take away. If any of those are missing, your chances of being successful are greatly reduced. I'm not saying you can't be successful without the full process, but this will greatly increase the chances of success if you have all of those components. So one of the takeaways uh, from the uh, Nanaimo 2018, the second one, was to align stewardship and local government efforts to reestablish creek shed function in the Mid-Island region. And this alignment mostly takes place with the vision. You know, you've got to align about the, uh, around the vision. You know, because that's really the, the direction that you're all supposed to be heading in. And the fact is that communities are just like drivers. You know, if they can't see where they're going, they're going to hit the brakes. And an awful lot of communities have good spirit. They've got a lot of things going for them, but they really don't know where they're going. And investors especially uh, hit the brakes when they're not sure where things are going. So the strategic renewal process, just to uh, further uh, show the relationships amongst the uh, pieces here, is the, the visions guide actions to the right outcome. The strategies guide actions to success. The programs perpetuate, evaluate, and adjust the actions. It should be a uh, the program should be run in an adapt adaptive management manner. The policies enable strategic actions, partnerships fund and support actions, and the projects are the actions. Those are the tactics that execute the strategy. <clears throat> and we started, the very first slide, I think, starting today's section, sessions uh, talked about actionable visions. The process is what makes the vision act actionable. The vision by itself can't go anywhere. So let's look at this in a slightly reversed uh, manner just to help you understand the importance of that vision. A project is how one implements a program. A program is how one implements a strategy. A strategy is how one implements a vision. So if you don't have a vision, you've got no foundation. Gotta, gotta have that vision. Strategy's only purpose is to implement the vision. You can have the best strategy in the world, but it's gotta have something to work with. It's gotta have something that's trying to achieve. I always love that quote from Yoko Ono. Just replace the word dream with vision. That's all she's talking about there. You need a shared vision. If you all have the same shared vision, or at least something very, very similar, um, then uh, it can become reality. And uh, I also love that uh, quote from Chris Grams. Where he's talking about stakeholder engagement. You know, don't just try to sell them on the destination. Get them involved in the journey to that destination. 
That's real stakeholder engagement. And one of the key things you've got to learn here, this is where so many efforts get sabotaged, is that community engagement happens at the wrong part of the process. You know, the 90% of the community engagement, stakeholder engagement, should happen during the visioning. That's the important part. You've got to make sure that that vision is what everybody really wants. And if you try to engage people later on, it can bring the whole process to a grinding halt. And especially if you're working with some private partners who are working on borrowed money, it can kill the entire thing entirely. Delays can be deadly. You know, do not engage at the wrong spot of the part of the process. If, if you properly engage people in creating that shared vision, and if they trust you to execute that vision and stick with that vision throughout the rest of the process, then that's really the only time they need to be engaged. So let's get back to those, uh, uh, some of the, uh, the nitty-gritty details of that three reading process. You know, uh, you're getting back to the assets that you've got to work with to revitalize the place. Now, some assets you look at and you just think, well, of course we're going to repurpose that. Yeah, that's worth keeping. Uh, in Washington, D.C., um, they're talking about moving, tearing down the FBI headquarters. I probably uh, know exactly what that looks like if you were a uh, uh, fan of Fox Mulders. Uh, I mean, it's a dead yeah, ugly building. <laughs> You know, but at least it was badly built. Um, you know, it was, it's a maintenance nightmare. Everything about this building is wrong. Um, you know, it, in the States, I'm not sure how it is up here, in the States, a uh, building can auto automatically be listed as uh, historic when it turns 50 years old, which, of course, the Europeans find is hilarious. Um, <laughs> I don't believe that trash becomes treasure on its 50th birthday. Well, hell, look at me. Um, sure didn't happen here. But an awful lot of the stuff we're building these days is really not worth restoring. So when you're looking at restoring a watershed and you're finding old buildings on it, you know, just don't, don't assume that because they're old, uh, you need to save them. Um, an awful lot of the buildings we create these days are trash on day one. They'll be in the landfill in 30 years. You know, this is the drive-in sector of my bank, you know, where people have bumped against it, and all there is underneath that stucco is styrofoam. <clears throat> we need to build, you know, as if we're planning to stick around. <laughs> you know, we're not just passing through on this planet. Uh, we need to build so that our grandkids can have their own restoration economy. We've inherited a lot of wonderful assets that we can renew. And one of the keys to restoring a watershed uh, that I see missing so often uh, in all kinds of natural resource restoration programs is all the people care about is the water or the watershed. Uh, and they miss out on so many wonderful project, uh, partnership possibilities and funding possibilities if they just uh, get out of that water silo um, and uh, you know, look around at the other categories of renewable assets that are in that watershed that other people want to renew, whether it's historic buildings, uh, whatever it might be, those, those can be some really powerful partners, both politically and for funding. Uh, one thing to keep in mind um, you know, when we're building all this trash is that when somebody tells you they're building the code, all they're really saying is that it was any worse, so it would be illegal. <laughs> yeah. So don't assume they're building something that's worth restoring just because it needs code. Yeah, we've got a lot of stuff out there that looks restorable, um, but uh, you know, we, we're throwing up some really flimsy structures and we'll slap some fake stones on you know, a veneer of stones or a veneer of bricks or whatever. You know, there's so much of it, an architect friend of mine says America's suffering from venereal disease. <laughs> So I just want to throw that in there just to kind of open the, the, uh, the view a little bit. So remember that watersheds have built assets, they have cultural assets, they have heritage assets, and the more of those renewable assets that come together in your strategy and your vision, 
um, the more likely they are to, to revitalize the place. You know, people don't come to your watershed just to see your trees. They come to your watershed to maybe to visit a historic downtown, go to a microbrewery, and you know, to see um, see beautiful old buildings. So it's, it's not just about the frogs and the salamanders, uh, despite my herpetological background. Um, even if you've got a really good process, you put all the time and effort into this process, and you've got the right vision, the right strategy, I guarantee you, no matter how hard you work on it, there are going to be some surprises. It's just the nature of working in complex systems. I mean, the guy who painted that van, I don't think there's any way he could really think ahead and say, what's going to happen when the door slides open? You know, you're just going to be taken by surprise sometimes. You know, you've also got the uh, age-old war between planners and humans. Um, that, you know, humans as individuals don't like to be controlled. Entire societies don't like to be controlled. You know, nature doesn't like to be controlled. They'll always find a way around your efforts to control them. So we've got to really work in a very adaptive, sensitive way with both the human side and the, and the natural side. So, if you want to learn more about that, um, uh, go to revitalization.org. You've got over 6,200 articles there, all about re stuff, uh, built and natural and social and economic. And uh, as uh, Richard said, my next book's coming out in the fall, but if you uh, subscribe to Revitalization, you can actually read the book online uh, free of charge. So, let me finish up. Um, Talking a little bit about the kids. Uh, you know, it's a scary world out there, as you haven't noticed. And it's an especially scary world for a kid. You know, so the last thing a kid needs is to uh, be educated with outmoded skills and knowledge. You know, and an awful lot of the education that's out there is still based on the old economy model. You know, they're just assuming sprawl, assuming virgin resource extraction. You know, the, the new gen next generations, they need a whole new mindset. Um, <laughs> but it's not just the kids who need the new mindset. And it's, this is a scary world for adults who have outmoded skills, too. You know, they've got to be prepared uh, for the changes that are on the way as a result of the Anthropocene. It, it's here. So uh, that's the reason I, in just a couple months, we're going to be launching the Reconomics Institute that's going to be uh, training people in how to facilitate these sorts of regenerative processes at the community and regional level. Don't bother going to Reconomics.org right now. It's coming in, in late June. You won't see anything at that URL right now. Um, but uh, you know, one of the major focuses of it is training and certifying uh, revitalization and resilience facilitators. And uh, I say facilitators because this is, they're not planners, not architects, not engineers, uh, at least not as a result of this certification. Most of them will be architects, engineers, landscape architects, planners, economic developers, uh, but also uh, just citizens who want to help revitalize their communities and their regions, and they want to be the person at the table who actually knows what the process is for bringing together all these stakeholders to achieve much greater return on the investment. So thank you very much. Thank you, Storm. So we're at the end of the symposium. I see we've got almost the room quite, quite full. So. I want to thank everyone for making the trip here to lovely Parksville. I know the city's been a great host. I've had a wonderful time. I hope things have been worthwhile. I hope you're leaving here revitalized, renewed, reinvigorated, reconnected, especially reconnected. Those of you who have heard, 2020, the partnership, again, has made a commitment to come to the island, to come to where energy, partnerships, 
new opportunities are. So we'll look forward to seeing you, your friends, your colleagues, other new stakeholders that you might be willing to bring with you next year over here on the island. Thank you very, very much for coming.